Whether you're a fan of Assassin's Creed or the gaming sphere in general, for better or worse, you will know the name Arnor Dorian, and if you don't, you will recognise his face. Holy Jesus! What is that? What the fuck is that? Assassin's Creed Unity went down in history as one of the most broken, buggy releases in gaming history, and became iconic for its terrible technical performance on the newly released next generation of consoles, after a massive and high profile marketing campaign that intended to shoot the franchise back to the forefront of popularity after concluding the Desmond saga. The colossal backlash caused the hard work and effort of the team to be regarded as a joke. The incredible graphic fidelity, improved stealth systems and one-to-one -one recreation of Paris were no longer in the conversation, but instead the missing faces, broken co-op and terrible PC port was what all gamers were talking about for the most part of 2015 after the game's release. You wouldn't be in the minority to say that you had very little recollection of the Unity campaign. The marketing for the game promoted four characters in the majority of the posters, and trailers with particular emphasis on co-op and customization to build your own assassin to play with your friends. There was much speculation amongst the community as to how many playable characters there were, with a special Elise trailer hinting at both an assassin and Templar protagonist. In reality, you play as Arno Victor Dorian, French nobleman turned master assassin, and the game follows his pursuit of revenge, in a similar style to Ezio, but in an attempt to break the formula, it blurs the lines between who's in the right. Today we're going to dive into one of the franchise's most controversial characters. If you're unfamiliar with my character study series, then please check out the prior episodes. This series aims to shine a light on the protagonists of Assassin's Creed, and dive a little deeper into the understanding of their characters, more than a normal video would. Looking at the design, implementation and arc that the character has. Today's study is on Arno. Was he overshadowed by the game he was in, or is it best his character left forgotten? Let's take a look. Starting as always, let's look at the character design. The primary role a design should do is give you a good first impression of the character, without needing to hear them speak. Taking from Ezio's book, we first see Arno in his nobleman getup as a child and teenager. A lot of comparisons could be made with Ezio, as it is a clear attempt to evoke similar emotions that we had with him. Both Ezio and Arno share a ponytail, baggy sleeves, and a tailored waistcoat that draws attention to the character's arms. Everything I said for Ezio applies here. The ponytail implies there is a sense of unkeptness to the nobleman, keeping his hair out the way instead of getting it cut. This longer, wavy hair emphasises his youth and perhaps arrogance and naivety we can expect from his actions early on. The outfit is primarily black and white, which implies a very simple mindset coming from his rich background, however also foreshadows his later alignment with Elise and cooperation with the Templars, using both good and evil to obtain his own goals. Unlike Ezio's nobleman design, however, very little of Arno's carries over into his assassin robes except for his ascot, which does break up the colour scheme and gives us a glimpse at something that differentiates Arno from Ezio, which is a bit of a darker streak. Ezio seemed to have his entire life set out ahead of him, he was content and happy in the comfort of his family but Arno has already experienced tragedy with the loss of his father at a young age, giving him an internal anger and conflict he has yet to come to terms with, so it bubbles underneath a charming persona just waiting to blossom. I think it's important to note this now because I don't think there is enough examples of this conveyed to really get the point across that Arno is very emotional and can easily snap. His assassin robes, in general, carry over a very uniform look to them, as they are quite void of personality. They create a very plain silhouette, especially from the back, 
and the front, whilst having a hint of both cream and red, is primarily sunken in a navy blue, a colour not seen before from any of our protagonists. At face value, this could simply be to have his costume incorporate all the colours of the French flag. However, I think it goes a little deeper than that, as the French military of the time also wore blue uniforms. Arno is, in this sense, a drone for the assassins. He doesn't look like he has come into his own. He hides his personality and his true intentions very much underneath the hood. He joins the assassins not from a true understanding of the creed, but from a selfish want for redemption. This differentiates Arno massively from other protagonists, since all prior inductions into the creed were made when the character had a true understanding and had fully accepted the role they would play in their story. Altair was raised from birth to become an assassin, and only after joining did his resentment shine through. Ezio was observed from afar, and after proving himself worthy, the assassins revealed themselves and initiated him into their ranks. Connor was trained by Achilles, with the skills and knowledge needed prior to putting on his robes, and Edward learned over the course of his journey what it meant to be an assassin before finally accepting that his goals and theirs weren't so different. Each protagonist gives us a deeper look at how the Brotherhood operates, from their point of joining them. By allowing Arno to join immediately, based on his bleeding effect, it paints the Brotherhood of France as hastier and more reckless, maybe even corrupt from the start, since they have no reason to let Arno work for them so early on, despite his knowledge from Belloc during their time in the Bastille. His costume in this sense shows that Arno is not being allowed to flourish, which we can see from his master assassin outfit at the end of the game. This outfit combines all the primary colours and adds a regal gold to his costume. Personally, I think the suit is a bit over-designed, but it does fully show Arno becoming the person he wants to be, fully confident in himself a newfound responsibility in the creed that he has discovered along his journey. Now, normally at this point, I would like to move on to the story of the game, but there is a sinister second reason why Arno's outfit could be so plain. As aforementioned, this game had a massive push on creating your own assassin, and playing with your friends in a myriad of different colours and combinations which, in terms of conveying a consistent character design, is a little distracting. It's like the whole meme about your custom character in cutscenes, because the hilarity of some of the options take you out of the experience entirely, and break your immersion in the story. It also creates a divide between the character and the player. Take Geralt in The Witcher video games. Fuck. We make the dialogue choices thinking about what he would do, and putting ourselves in his position to get the best outcome. Let's see if there was a sarcastic option. No, I'm Jangles, the moon monkey. That's just what a synth would do. It would switch our brains back to reality and start thinking about what we wanted, and not what the character wants. Assassin's Creed has had different costume options ever since AC2 but each costume was still retained within the universe, except for maybe the Desmond or Raiden skin. However, a personal gripe of mine is when the costume inherently changes something about the character. It's fun to wear costumes like the Templar Knight in Rogue, or the Mayan Armour in Black Flag, because they are usually late game additions and give a in-universe explanation for existing. Wearing them in cutscenes in some cases can look goofy and out of place, which takes you away from your immersion in that scene. But Unity, from the very first moment you put Arno's outfit on, encourages you to swap it out for different pieces of gear in order to keep up with the skill gap. It's no longer a choice to stay in the canonical costume, but instead a necessity to wear a giant feather on your head and Domino Mask in order to have the highest stealth stat, which I feel takes away from Arno's portrayal, and specifically his motion-captured performance when his face is obscured. In this case, I think the costumes should have been more consistent, 
with Arnold's character, a bit like Bayek's non-transactional ones, or have been delegated to the co-op system only, if they were going to be class-based anyway. We also hinder our progress in the game if we want to stay in character the whole time. Now, admittedly, we've seen the series delve much deeper into the customization options and break the law worse than Unity could ever have imagined, so I'm not bashing Unity too harshly for its customization options. If we turn a blind eye to how horrendous this becomes later on down the line, then it is still my opinion that this game stretches the character traits too thin in the customization. Regarding the actual classes, I should note now that I don't feel like the inclusion of a class system breaks from Arno's character too much. He is never defined by his weapons as much as someone like Connor was. His tomahawk and other Native American weaponry was a symbol of his heritage and the village he was fighting for. It was an important part of his character, which not many of the other games really repeated except for maybe Odyssey. It's with this in mind that the weapon options for Arno, the sword, axes, rifle and much more that could be chosen for him to wield don't impact his character much at all, and simply serve as a preference for the player, so I don't think they need to be addressed in this section. There is one exception to this, which I will bring up in its respective area, but for now, let's leave that be. I want to reinforce my argument a bit more about the specific gear that compromises Arno's character. The Phantom Gear is a primary choice when doing a stealth route, and despite its flamboyant appearance, this is gear that any player in the game will be drawn towards for its impressive ratings in regards to stealth. This was back when Assassin's Creed was about being an assassin, and so stealth was still admirable and recommended to the player. I'm not arguing that the outfit is bad, it looks exceptionally fitting for the time period and would fit in very well at a masquerade ball like the one we see at the beginning of the game. For a French assassin, I think it's a fitting disguise, however I don't think it's a very good reflection of Arno as his character. When becoming an assassin, Arnold loses a lot of his charm and is solely a precision killer, very focused on manipulation to get what he wants, which is not very fitting with the eccentric outfit and can take a lot of players out of the experience if they're looking deep enough. To wrap up this section on the character design, we have one final note, and that is the inclusion of Arnold's fearless outfit. The reason I mention this is because it's the first outfit we see Arno in as part of the promotional marketing campaign. Cast your mind back to March 21st, 2014, when the first official reveal of the game was made. This was a very early build of the game and features Arno in a completely different outfit from his final appearance in the game, one that is actually given to the player for free and has since been somewhat retconned to be his official robes, both in statues produced after the game came out and also being the version of Arno's outfit gifted to the player as an unlockable reward in Assassin's Creed 3 Remastered, which was the last time we have seen Arno's outfit in an Assassin's Creed game. This outfit is notably very raggedy compared to his fitted final appearance, very loose hanging and with a hood that resembles Edward Kenway's in the previous game without a beaked hood, as maybe this was going to at one point be the direction going forward in regards to the assassin's design universally, before deciding to go back to a traditional beak. This is actually the last time we would see such an implementation put in place. The outfit itself resembles a lower class with a combination of different textures and materials, an untucked shirt and loose ascot, which implies a very different character for Arno, one brought up in poverty and perhaps given a chance to be an assassin as his only chance to escape it. This is just speculation, but the outfit does not scream nobleman to me, and so I think the biggest takeaway is that Arno's character went through a radical change in development, and the team originally wanted him to be more of a rough scoundrel, but settled with the safer backstory similar to Ezio. 
Personally, I don't think the outfit fits Arno in his current form, but it definitely has a much better design, bursting with personality, and implies a very different character that would have impacted the game's story massively if Arno joined the Brotherhood because he saw no other alternative. December 27th, 1776. A young Arno Victor Dorian and his father Charles Dorian attend the Palace of Versailles. We see here a quick conversation with Charles Dorian, where we see some of the character traits that will haunt Arno in his later life. We learn that he is impatient and lacks courage, a great piece of foreshadowing for the tragic consequences that this tale will teach Arno. We learn that Arno doesn't listen to instructions, his mind often wanders and he complains when told what to do. Yes, these seem like just what any child would act like, but they do carry on into his later life. Although I just realised I'm, <laughs> I'm calling him a child when he's, when he's grown up. Here Arno receives his father's pocket watch, something that was present even in the game's first ever reveal and was heavily featured in the marketing as an important asset to Arno, but we currently do not know the significance it holds. We're then introduced to Elise, the main love interest for the game, an incredibly important character to Arno's development, and one that the game draws your attention to straight away as she pushes Arno into disobeying orders and going against the word of authority, which perfectly sets up the dynamic the two will have later on in the story, and makes you question from the beginning whether the romance between the two is a good thing for their progression or if it is doomed to end in suffering. Seeing how the pair interact as children is a much more effective way of establishing their dynamic than by simply saying through dialogue that they have a history, and the story going forward will be better for it because we know these characters have known each other a long time and have a pre-established bond when we are reintroduced to them as adults. I think this section also perfectly sets the tone of the game with the conclusion of the scene. By the character of their Elise. Father? We should all be called our Come parents. here, girl, now. Father? Arno returns to his meeting point to find a crowd around his father's body, and we know exactly what has happened. At this moment, Arno is tainted forever. His father has been murdered in his absence, and he can only blame himself for not being there. We also turn to Elise for blame, as she drove him away, but ultimately, as children, we know there is nothing Arno could have done even if he was there. Now, cheating a little and looking ahead, we know that this plot point about Arno's father dying does not factor into the plot of the game. The game is not about seeking revenge for his father's killer, and therefore with that foresight in mind, it's all the more effective that we have no idea what happened. We know his father was obviously in a position where he was being targeted, and that somebody got to him. We don't even know his father was an assassin, as it doesn't really serve any purpose to this story. Much like Batman, not knowing who the killer is makes the message the forefront of his death. His innocence was stripped away by an unknown force out of his control. And as we've seen, Arno likes to be in control, and gets impatient when he has to wait for someone else. 
The shattering of the pocket watch informs us of its purpose in the story. His switch from a well-off child to being a broken man. Now addressing the elephant in the room, because while it's never mentioned in this game, we do know the entire context of his father's death if you've played through Assassin's Creed Rogue. Arno's father was in possession of a precursor box, which gets very law heavy, but essentially, he had an important item that a man named Shea Patrick Cormac was tasked to retrieve. It took him decades, but killing Arno's father completed his mission and allowed him to live out the rest of his life in peace, knowing he had helped to secure a better tomorrow for his faction, the Templars, over in the American colonies. This fantastically interweaves the games, but provides a very different purpose on both sides. As explained prior, we know how his death will affect Arno. From the other side's perspective, we see how much bigger the killing was, and yet it is bigger in a personal sense to another character. Killing Arno's father was the conclusion of Shear's story, and a wonderful way to cap off his character in a way that indirectly affects Arno's. There will be very conflicting opinions on whether Arno should have tracked down Shear and killed him in order to enact revenge, but the facts are that Shear was never detected during his time in France. The French Brotherhood had no idea he was operating in Versailles, and there was no evidence that Arno could have used to track him down. Shear was a Templar trained by assassins, and his final act serves as the perfect way to show him utilising both sides of his skill set to complete his mission without being detected. This reinforces the point that when it comes to Charles's death, there was nothing Arno could have done. From this point, we flash forward and discover that Arno has been adopted by Francois de la Serre, Grand Master of the Templar Order and Elise's father. <laughs> I'm getting some Attack on Titan vibes here, which changes up the formula somewhat and gives us a twist by making Arno be raised under the Templars without realising it, while Elise has been unaware of her secret training to take over from Francois's position. At this point in the game, we have skipped forward 13 years to 1789. Arno is fully grown up and displaying a lot of the qualities much like Ezio did in Assassin's Creed 2. He is cocky and charming, witty and not taking life very seriously. We can see he is clearly compensating for the trauma of losing his father by abusing the rich family he was adopted by and throwing it all away. What is most apparent here is that he is even willing to gamble away his father's pocket watch, which is where I find some conflict. The importance of the pocket watch is clearly felt through the opening sequence, and even later on in the game as a possession that Arno would never want to lose, and so gambling it must imply a great deal of overconfidence and naivety, and clearly disrespect for what his father stood by. I don't think this is out of character when we consider that Arno was raised by the Templars, and they will have been very aware of who Charles Dorian was, and have put a great deal of effort into making Arno dislike or even renounce his father as a way to keep him as far away from the assassins as possible. Now this is not explicitly said in the game, but I believe the context clues are there to suggest that Arno has been raised this way. The game actually plays out very similar to AC2 here, almost to a T, with Arno having to deliver a message to Francois which will warn him of an assassination attempt and it's Arno's recklessness and impatience that allows him to make a fatal error and simply slide the letter under his door instead of delivering it to him directly and saving his life. There. Safe and sound, and only slightly delayed. And now... I think it's very good for his character that it is a subtle variation of Ezio's story, as Arno is now directly responsible for the assassination attempt succeeding, whereas in Assassin's Creed 2, the delivering of letters was slowly cluing in the player that not all was as it seemed with the Auditoria family, and slowly enlightening both the character and audience that something bad was on the horizon. Unity instead goes for a shock value effect, since we have no idea what's coming until the tonal shift hits us with the assassination. You're right, monsieur. Too much of the king's champagne. 
Monsieur. Monsieur de la Serre. Monsieur de la Serre. Arnaud makes this reckless decision so he will have time to see Elise. And this is another example where we see Elise and Arnaud being in negative impact on each other. As he is more interested in her than to do his job. The comparisons between Romeo and Juliet can't be ignored, but I like that Unity treats them more three-dimensionally and establishes their both ups and downs, as it's clearly a very toxic relationship, but they have moments of showing that there was something there between the two that could have worked, which is incredibly important when getting you to care about them throughout the story. It also reminds me of my favourite line from Black Flag, which I touched on in my Edward Kenway character study. It's that what if that gets the audience invested in the characters. In that case, it suggested that the Pirates of Nassau could have been decent and well-off members of society, if it wasn't for the dark temptations of fame and fortune that dragged them into piracy. I think the line fits Arno and Elise as well, as it's their love for each other that drags them down and causes them to make several mistakes in the story that could have been avoided. It's just like poetry, it rhymes. Once again, Arno loses a parental figure, however, this actually is his fault, and he could have done something to stop it, which is where he gets his comeuppance, and Arno begins his redemption story as he is blamed for the death of Francois, and sent to the Bastille. Not to comment on the piercing of the story, but it feels like it should have happened much later on, and it does reincorporate the fact that Arno is irresponsible, but it feels like too much in one go. I would make the argument that if Francois was going to die, it should have happened a little bit later on, maybe towards the end of the second act, so we get a bit of time with Arnaud to grow more with his character before he gets belittled again. I believe that if they wanted to show Arnaud had not learned from his previous mistakes, then maybe he should have been more responsible for his father's death, or especially not being a child. It feels out of character for Arno to be as happy-go-lucky as he is, and not have learned from the mistakes he made as a child, especially when there is no given reason for why he acts this way as an adult, other than to make him more likeable for the player before he becomes an assassin, which makes this whole opening sequence feel very muddled, and pacing-wise, it is too much at once for the audience to take in, with the story feeling like it is stop-starting multiple times. We then get into the third section of this prologue, which is where Arno is now in the Bastille, and has a newfound bitterness and angst, which can be put down to his existing character trait of wanting to be in control and do things his way. Being in prison is the opposite of how Arno would like to be, and this makes his character descend into being more confrontational and aggressive. Here, however, we meet Belek, an assassin of the French Brotherhood, and our first glimpse into the assassin's side of the conflict. Belek takes on the missing parental figure that Arno is missing, and after learning of his connection to Charles Dorian, he befriends Arno and teaches him how to fight, which, considering Arno's character shift, almost makes it feel like he is putting Arno in his place. And at this moment, many players may feel disconnected to Arno or even dislike him which is a major problem Unity has from this point, that his happy-go-lucky self is largely gone and forgotten, and instead we get the character we should have been introduced to in his adult introduction, since he is no longer hiding his trauma with humour, but brings out a harsh persona which can seem whiny at times. I want to reiterate here that while that part might have sounded a bit negative, I do think it is still in character for Arno to act this way, in these conditions, and even though I refer to him as unlikable in this moment, I don't think that in any way makes him a bad character, but it does flesh him out more, as we see him outside of his comfort zone. Long story short, we don't really learn much about Arno's character too much in the Bastille, apart from seeing some fantastic spectacle as they break free, and Belloc encourages Arno to join the assassins. If you can pluck your head out of your own arts, come find us. Make a great fit. Goodbye, piss pot! It doesn't sound like fantastic motivation for Arno to join, but it does keep it vague enough that we will believe Arno is joining out of his own free will. 
The interesting dynamic we have here is a man who was raised under Templar ideology joining the assassins out of choice, and seeing how he interacts in their environment and contests their beliefs. Arno is now a fantastic opportunity to give us some real insight into the Creed, and if it holds up under scrutiny, which at the least gives us a better fleshed out view of the Brotherhood here in Paris, whilst also allowing Arno to go on his hero's journey, and learn to be less selfish and protect the ones he loves. So while we don't learn too much directly, the implications for the story to come reach their absolute peak, and despite some wonky piercing, I think this is the perfect opportunity to drop this. Hey, man. Still fucking spectacular, eh? Arno, now free of any constraints, returns to Elise, and it is here where Arno learns that Elise already knew about the Assassin and Templar War, and the role that their fathers played in it. She comments on it being inevitable that they would fall onto different sides, and blames Arno for not being there to deliver the message correctly, which indirectly makes him responsible for her father's death. I swear to you, I had nothing to do with his death. But you did. No. No! By my life, I swear I didn't! Is that...? A letter intended for my father the day he was murdered. Read it. Grandmaster de la Serre. I have learned through my agents that an individual within our order plots against you. I beg you to be on your guard at the initiation tonight. Trust no one, not even those you call friends. May the Father of Understanding guide you. L. I found that on the floor of my father's room. An open. This is naturally a lot for Arno to take in, learning that not only is Elise fully aware of being a Templar, but after reading the letter, he now also knows that that very letter could have saved her father's life. It naturally puts a lot of guilt on his shoulders, whereas we can imagine he spent a lot of time in the Bastille completely unaware of his own involvement, and so to be quickly thrown this much information would make him act irrationally. On a side note, this letter reveals what the main plot of the game is, which is rightly given to us at the earliest possible moment. And obviously, to understand the rest of the game, I think it's important to go through this. The Templars are going through a civil war of sorts amongst their ranks. We know there is a traitor plotting to overthrow De La Serre's way of thinking, which now has been passed on to Elise, making her a prime target for this hidden uprising. This makes us see that the Templars are at their most vulnerable, but in order to carry out our mission, we would need to risk killing Elise in the process which would be the ideal conflict to have Arno go through. Overwhelmed from the implication of his involvement, we have Arno take up Belloc's offer to join the assassins. When greeting Belloc, we see a glimpse of Arno now fully back in control. He is the one with the power in this scenario as he mocks the theatrics of Belloc's demeanour and how the assassins lurk in the shadows underground but also that he doesn't much care and is only thinking of himself. The main theme of Arno's story is redemption, and this is the first moment that we see Arno address his flaws, and what must be changed in order to achieve it. He acknowledges that he has caused Elise a great deal of suffering, and the responsibility of becoming the new Grand Master, when it could make her a target. It's in this desperation that we see Arno join the Assassins. This is massively different from other games as stated earlier, as this feels like Arno is using the Brotherhood's resources to carry out his own actions. His arc at this point seems quite disconnected from the Assassins, and due to this we never get a really clear idea of what the Assassins of Paris are trying to achieve, because Arno is not interested in them himself, which is an interesting way of setting up conflict later down the line and creating a mystery behind the information Arno has neglected to find out. When Arno takes the leap of faith, we get a glimpse at how he views the events in his life. 
first getting a series of paintings which supposedly depicts his birth to death. The assassins consider the initiation to be a rebirth, and Arno sees it as a chance to move past what happened in his life and make amends. However, interestingly, the paintings depict his birth, his father's death, and then the Bastille, completely missing out any Templar involvement with the death of De La Serre. The assassins almost build the narrative for Arno. The reason they think he wants to join the assassins is not in fact his true motivation. When Arno leaps, we see flashes of De La Serre's death, the part of Arno that he's hiding, his true motivation. We see a recollection of the deaths of both father figures in his life, and then a reveal that tells us why Arno did not care about searching for his father's killer, because he believes that he is the reason he died. When Arno emerges a novice of the Brotherhood, he is told this line. Arno Dorian is dead. He has been culled from this world, his sins and failures turned to dust. Tonight he is reborn, a novice of the Assassin Brotherhood. I find Arno's reaction to this be incredibly interesting, because for a moment we see him flinch. This little micro-expression leads me to believe he did not agree with what was being said. Arno did not want to leave his old life behind, he wanted to use the Brotherhood to get his old life back. We see into his psyche and see that he views himself as a killer, and so joining the assassins is a way of fully embracing that persona and using it for vengeance. The next few missions throw us into the typical Assassin's Creed formula, after an interaction that explains that the Templars are weak, and a peace treaty must be given up to strike at the best time, which leads us on to the first target. We are given a massive open space and several opportunities to kill him, leaving the player to make their own path. We have another interaction with Belek, where his character seems to have shifted somewhat. He seems to resent being stuck with Arno and says he doesn't wish to help him land his target. And then he asks him to kill himself. Why not sacrifice yourself? It's odd to see this from the same character that trained Arno, and it feels like we've missed a scene where Arno perhaps, I don't know, killed a target in a way that Belloc disapproved of. Or, to add my own little rewrite into the mix, I think the first target should have been one completely unrelated to Arno's investigation, and instead of going after said target, he compromises his kill to track down another man connected to the murder, which would have given Belloc prime motivation to be untrustworthy of Arno, now onto the actual target himself. I think it's important to make a comparison here. Whilst Assassin's Creed games have you kill people straight away, the first main target has a real significance to the protagonist. In particular, we have AC2, where you kill the man who betrayed your family and got them killed, only to reveal that there was a massive web of conspirators that he left behind. AC3 has you kill a man particularly targeting Connor's village, which makes his successful assassination feel like the first step towards achieving peace. Usually these first kills are important because they start the string of targets to follow. They inform us of what the protagonist is seeking and how further killings will achieve this. More importantly, using the memory corridor confession scenes, we also get a glimpse at the dynamic between the protagonist and their target. To be more explicitly informative to the player what difference this kill makes, and how they inform the protagonist's mindset going forward. With that in mind, this first assassination is a man named Siva, who is trying to corrupt the church and was conveniently present during the death of De La Serre, which puts him in a fantastic position for both Arno and the assassin's goals to align. Upon tracking down and killing Siva, we're given a very different form of confession, unlike anything seen in the games before, as Arno gets given a look into Siver's memories, instead of speaking to him directly. On one hand, it is better to show not tell in order to convey the plot to your audience, but on the other hand, it is entirely plot relevant, and serves to put together the mystery of who killed De La Serre, and not establish a personal connection between Siver and Arno, to establish more of an insight into Arno's character. This might seem small, but it means we are missing half a dozen scenes of character development for Arno, which in part misses out huge chunks 
where Arnold establishes a connection to his targets. Look at Bayek in Assassin's Creed Origins. A lot of his confessions were extremely emotional and establish how the antagonist's actions affected him. You are no one. Bayek of nothing. Father to nobody! <laughs> And here is your nobody! May the Hidden One greet you. The Lord of the Duat awaits. Without these scenes, we would feel a big gap in his motivation, which I feel that Arno is indeed missing. Arno kills Sivir because he saw him next to Delacere and heard his name get called out on the night of the murder, which implied that he was the killer. We should have seen Arno confront this man in person, the man he thought killed Delacere, and get that shock reaction when he found out it wasn't actually him and Arno did not need to have killed him at all. This unfortunately is missing, and the game for some bizarre reason chooses to drag us out of the Animus for fun Helix Rift missions instead of letting the weight of this kill hang on Arno. Now this does happen in most Assassin's Creed games where you get dragged out of the Animus after particularly important sequences, but without a confessional scene we have little to no idea how Arno initially took in this information, and so we have to move straight on to the second man present at the murder scene, Le Waditum. Both Latouche and Luadatum are noblemen turned beggars, which paints an interesting comparison for how Arno could have turned out, and their motivation is one of the better established ones in the game. This opportunity was given to them by the Templars, and so they desperately support their cause as a stark opposite to Arno, who doesn't care much for the assassin's intentions. Luadatum calls himself the King of Beggars, however his involvement in the story seems less interesting as his confessional scene doesn't disclose any new information about him other than the murder weapon, and that he was turned away from the Templars because of his lower class. You can see here that we've moved very swiftly onto the next target, and that is because the game itself also rushes into this second interaction. What did Arnor think of the way the lower class were treat? He obviously doesn't get a chance to sympathise, so I'm not really sure. The problem with a lot of the actual assassination missions is that they feel they are solely there to move us on to the next piece of the story, and not to give us an insight into Arnor's character or his beliefs. For this reason, I'm going to be skipping out most of these sections and only include the characters that impacted Arnor as a character himself because Arno is not given much in these missions at all, and you'll come to find it's not where the game wants you to be focusing on anyway. Following the breadcrumbs, we see Arno become increasingly impatient and uptight with others, as he becomes consumed by this murder case. The worst side of Arno's character comes out when he is not in control, and unfortunately, a murder case means that this is brought out often, where he'll stamp his feet and become impatient, as he seems to start frowning quite a considerable amount. You'll be seeing a lot of this face during your playthrough. His dry humour persists, but he's becoming consumed by the mission. Maybe assuming it would be more straightforward, however he never stops to reconsider his approach or the way he talks to other people. This creates a real problem, as it makes Arno still in character, but not a very likeable character to be playing as. There are countless moments for his character to change that are simply not taken. On one occasion, he kills an innocent man, Lafreniere, still a Templar, but one that wrote the letter that could have saved de la Serre's life, and that should have been a profound effect on Arno's character, where he stops and considers the approach to the mission he's been taking. But instead, he shouts at the council and insists they entertain him a while longer. At this point, the purpose of his mission seems lost, and his lust for vengeance is taking over and making him frustrated. Exactly halfway through the game, we are reintroduced to the character of Elise, and here we get a glimpse of Arno's personality returning, to pull him into the light, as he convinces her that he is still the same person he was. So? So? 
Seems you've been busy. Tracking down the man who killed your father, yes. Best of luck. He's killed most of my allies and intimidated the rest into silence. No closer now than I was two years ago. I've seen him. What? When? Where can I find him? I'm not sure that's a good idea. He wants you dead, Elise. What? You want to protect me? I want to help you. The Brotherhood has resources, manpower. You cannot be serious. I don't trust the assassins. I find it interesting that when describing the Brotherhood to Elise, he mentions their resources and influence, not their tenets or beliefs. His devotion to the mission has somehow kept him free of their influence, and he still fights for his own cause, making you wonder how much longer he can get away with this before he must own up to his own responsibilities. Do you trust me? I haven't changed that much, Elise. I'm still the same boy who, who distracted the cook while you stole the jam. The same one who helped you over the wall into that dog-infested orchard. All right. Take me to your brotherhood. I'll hear the offer. Offer may be a bit strong. This is where the plot goes a very interesting step deeper. The Templars are at their lowest and the idea of Arno and Elise using this to unite the two sides is really what the game has been leading to. The title of Unity makes complete sense here and implies that perhaps the status quo of the series could be about to change. Bearing in mind that this was the closest to the modern day the series had gone at the time, which meant they could go in any direction they wanted, and this could have indeed been the case. The problem with this is the way that Arno's character has been written up until this point, is that he uses the assassins, he doesn't believe in them. Whereas to unite both sides of the conflict, I feel like Assassin's Creed 3 already did this much better, by having an entire chapter dedicated to an assassin and Templar working together, and talking about their ideologies and ultimately it falling apart, which is something this story never considers to talk about. It does quite the opposite in fact, as the leader of the assassins Mirabor is killed shortly before a conclusion can be reached on whether to work with the Templars, which interrupts any development this plot could have had. It's discovered that the killer was none other than Belek. While this moment should have been Arno reacting with a lot of emotion, he seems very cold and argues with him as if it was any other squabble. I'm really struggling with this middle section because Arno is given so much to work with and yet he is written like a blank slate. He doesn't give the necessary responses to make his character develop. The mentor betraying the Brotherhood should have been a massive reveal. It should have been the moment Arno realises he cannot continue to use these people to get what he wants as the Brotherhood is dangerous and could get him hurt. He should try to reach out to Belek and encourage him to leave the Brotherhood with him, but their dynamic is so thinly addressed after the opening sequence that this just doesn't land, and the resulting fight and death of Belek comes to a shock for the player because we expected a little bit more from this teacher-student dynamic, but it hasn't been delivered or developed properly. <laughs> It sounds like I've thrown quite a lot at you there, and it's because the, the plot of the game really does develop incredibly quickly, and specifically a very muddled way. First we had a murder mystery within the Templar Order, then we've quickly shifted to the unity between both sides of the conflict, and now, immediately after, we have a murder mystery on the assassin side of things, and so we end this sequence of the game with neither the Assassins or Templars fully formed at all, so our main plot of unity falls completely aside. This side plot of the Assassins having a traitor amongst their mitts is now completely wrapped up, and we don't really return to the Assassins much for the rest of the game, instead swapping back to the Templar traitor, revealed to be a silversmith that we met earlier in the game, 
and at this point, he begins the French Revolution in order to wipe the slate clean. Being a sage means that the Grand Master Germain is not afraid to die, as due to law reasons, his multiple eye colours will allow him to be reborn. And so we finally get thrust into the horrific revolution of France that the game was marketed as. However, during this final third, we finally get conversation between Elise and Arnaud that furthers their characters, with the confirmation that despite the allocations and the sins of their past, they will continue to move forward, and they share a tender moment in a hot air balloon that settles Arnaud back into his confident persona, where he feels like his future is secure for maybe the first time in his life. It's beautiful. From up here, you'd never know the nation is tearing itself apart. Can... Can things ever go back to the way they were before, do you think? Do you? After everything that's happened. Everything we've lost. So that's it then. The course of history forever altered. Never again to return. Maybe we can't go back. But going forward isn't necessarily an ending. Please, I... And then a little while later, he steps too far and gets kicked out of the Brotherhood. The decision of this council is final. We give you leave to go. A failed assassination attempt on Germain causes Arnaud to finally get the telling off that he needed at the beginning of the game, and he returns to Versailles to begin his redemption arc that he believed he needed, but not as a lie to enter the Brotherhood, but a genuine belief. But first, he has to suffer. Edward Kenway had a similar moment when he thought all was lost, and drinks to forget his sorrows. Arnaud also isolates himself, becoming dishevelled and violent, focusing only on the pocket watch we had long since forgotten about. And then something magical happens. Arnaud is finally allowed to speak his mind. You look like hell. You look like you want something from me. That's a fine thing to say after you up and vanished. You made it fairly clear you no longer required my services. Don't. Don't you dare talk to me like that. What do you expect me to say, Elise? Forgive me for not letting you die? I'm sorry that I care more about you than about killing Germain. I thought we wanted the same thing. What I wanted was you. I can't bear the fact that my carelessness got your father killed. Everything I've done since then has been to fix that mistake and to prevent it from happening again. Arnold's haste and naivety begin to make sense in this moment. Why he was so reckless and quick-tempered. Arnold was late returning to his father to find him murdered. He didn't want to make that mistake again and get someone killed because he got distracted, so he focuses entirely on his mission. He never spoke his thoughts or gave his views on his targets, he just got the job done as quickly and efficiently as he could so he could protect the ones he loved. With this, Elise gives him the strength to return back to Paris without the Brotherhood. Arnaud never cared about them anyway, and now he goes to complete the mission as himself. Obviously, for gameplay reasons, you go back to wearing the assassin robes, but the sentiment is there that, you know, he, he probably wouldn't be wearing them again if, if it wasn't for the branding. After a race to find the Grand Master and finishing off the final few targets that were devoted to him, we find ourselves in the final act. Arnaud confronts Germain, now possessing the powerful Sword of Eden, which takes their fight from the top of a temple down to the Templar crypt. Germain has already won at this point by starting the French Revolution, and so this fight could have been avoided entirely. Germain wanted to continue the words of Templar Jacques de Molay, and had no desire for peace, 
causing the revolution in order to enact this ideology. Arno and Elise are powerless to stop him, but their combined lust for revenge brings them to this location, and they believe it will be the first step towards making things right. The unfortunate reality is that this will come to light in a very different way to how they imagine. Germain's mechanics during the boss fight lean into using your assassin's skills as a way to defeat him, as a confrontational approach would lead to him using his Sword of Eden and blasting you backwards, which meant that the best way to defeat him was to use the shadows and adapt to the tenets of the Creed in order to defeat him. This could be the first time that Arno sees the true benefits of the Brotherhood, aside from their resources, but instead how their approach can lead to a victory without any collateral damage. Unfortunately, the realisation of this hits a bit too late, as Elise does not share the same approach. Elise rushes into the confrontation, and throughout the fight is reckless and emotional. It seems that upon having this lust for revenge, she has completely lost sight of the other important things in her life, like maintaining a positive vision for the new Templars, or her relationship with Arno. And upon the end of the boss fight, we find Arno trapped under some rubble, and unable to free himself in time to stop Elise, from running in and trying to land a killing blow to Germain. We see Arno once again trapped, and unable to stop the one he loves from getting hurt. His character almost feels like it has not moved at all from the opening scene of the game, history repeating itself once again, and Elise perishes to Germain's sword. There's a sex joke in there somewhere. The main question here is did Arno learn anything at all across his journey? It seems through the execution of this scene like Arno was unable to show us if he had truly grown as a character, because they stuck him underneath a rock. Elise was never the one to rush in recklessly, this was more of Arno's character trait, and it seems like the roles were swapped in order to keep Arno alive for expansions or DLC. I believe that if we swap the roles here, and Arno sacrifices his relationship with Elise to get a chance at making a difference and saving the ones he loves, then we get quite a heartwarming sacrifice, in which Arno realises the error of his ways, but also that he was unable to save the deer, and so this final act is more of a suicide mission for him to do something and make things right. This conclusion would also leave Elise alive to pass on her newfound ideology to the Templar Order, and what Arno taught her, showing that Arno could still have a legacy by inspiring a new ideology among the Templars, one more willing to accept peace and work to unite the assassins together with them instead of continuing the war. The ending we do get is a bitter one. We have no idea what will become of either the assassins or Templars. All we know for certain is that Germain won, and the French Revolution will be the consequence. Arno has to basically start his arc fresh, as if it was the first scene of the game, and the finishing off of Germain with a slow and painful kill just shows his confusion and guilt, since he knows that there's nothing he can do to get the revenge he wants. Before we get on to the epilogue of the game, I would like to mention the modern day plot that these games continued to slap on which recontextualizes why we are following Arno's journey. I'll describe this in the easiest way possible. Germain has two different coloured eyes, and so we need to keep an eye on where his body ends up. Which is why we follow Arno's story, because we need to know what happens to Germain. It's a strange little narrative, since Germain isn't introduced until halfway through the game, and it never feels important other than to end the game by saying that despite Arno being a complete mess, we as the player did a wonderful job, which really takes you out of the story a little bit and makes your final moments in the game not even one spent in Arno's shoes. Some Assassin's Creed games do a wonderful job of combining the current day situation with the story in the Animus to create a fantastic parallel. This is unfortunately not one of them, and leaves many players very confused by the end of the game because we're not sure emotionally what we should be feeling. Should we be bittersweet because of Arno's failure? Or should we be happy because we managed to track down the Sage and learn of his location? 
this is a place where the game really falls at the last hurdle. However, on to Arno's closing monologue. Arno has swapped to wearing his set of Master Assassin robes, which I mentioned back in the character design section. It's implied here that many years have passed, and Arno has chosen to go back to the Assassins and complete his training. This means his entire character arc has happened off screen. But let's see what he's learned. <clears throat> Hello. <laughs> yes, sorry, not what you were expecting. So unfortunately, due to YouTube's fantastic copyright system, um, I would not be able to get this video monetized if I included the following clip of Arno's monologue. There is a piece of music that plays in the background that has been copyright striked. So unfortunately, while I would love to go in and remove the music, it would be very time consuming. And what I'm going to have to do is just record it, me speaking. <laughs> and I'll just recollect his speech and we'll go from there. So yeah, sorry that I can't include the full clip. Obviously, I've included some clips throughout this video, which, you know, is already pushing things a bit. So I don't want to push things any further with the copyright system. So cheers for that. And I'll, uh, I'll see you after. The creed of the Assassin Brotherhood teaches us that nothing is forbidden to us. Once I thought that meant we were free to do as we would, to pursue our ideals no matter the cost. I understand now. Not a grant of permission. The creed is a warning. Ideals too easily give away to dogma. Dogma becomes fanaticism. No higher power sits in judgment of us. No supreme being watches to punish us for our sins. In the end, only we ourselves can guard against our obsessions. Only we can decide whether the road we walk carries too high a toll. We believe ourselves redeemers, avengers, saviors. We make war on those who oppose us, and they in turn make war on us. We dream of leaving our stamp upon the world, even as we give our lives in a conflict that will be recorded in no history book. All that we do, all that we are, begins and ends with ourselves. Phew, wee. Oh. It's bloody intense, isn't it? The Brotherhood teaches us that nothing is forbidden to us. This seems to be a misunderstood interpretation of the line. Nothing is true, everything is permitted. It doesn't mean you are permitted to use the Brotherhood as you wish for your own ends. It means you should be willing to embrace a new way of seeing the world. Again, it's a matter of the Creed's ideology and not their resources. But I'll give Arno the benefit of the doubt because he is describing his past mindset. Arno then says that he thought he would be free to pursue his own ideals, that he could use the Brotherhood to achieve his own perfect life with Elise, but that this was wrong, and the Creed is actually a warning that living this way gives in to the worst aspects of your personality, and to let it bubble to the surface. It's nice to see Arno acknowledge that he should not have used the Brotherhood, it is only himself that he can blame for his actions and the people who have unfortunately suffered due to them. I believe this in particular is in reference to the French Revolution itself, and his indirect causing of it by allowing Germain to complete his plan, which of course led to a myriad of suffering for years. Arno accepts responsibility for his actions and how he cannot make an impact on the world, but only an impact on himself, and no history book retelling can change the truth, and how it impacts the people responsible. I really love this speech because it shows Arno has compassion for others and offers a fantastic reflection on the French Revolution itself and how it impacted all those involved by mixing in the assassin ideology, which gives you some idea maybe what the writers were going for with the assassin's involvement in this game. Unfortunately, due to the story, they are completely vacant for the French Revolution part of the game, and so we never get to see how such a massive scale event affected them and their beliefs. I still unfortunately can't ignore the fact that all of this occurs during a time skip, 
and we largely don't see it play out in Arno's head for ourselves throughout the course of the game. It leaves us with a lot of unanswered questions about how he came to this conclusion, which could have been covered in this free expansion added to the game after launch, one that did bridge the gap between the death of Elise and Arno returning to the Assassins. I think it's time we take a little step back to look at the events of Dead Kings. France's wounds may be healing, but mine only fester. Dead Kings is truly baffling. Before writing this video, I hadn't played Dead Kings since it came out, and I was fully in the mindset of it answering all the questions I had regarding Arno's return to the Brotherhood, and his character's motivation and turnaround in the story. However, it seems that the execution of this is anything but. If you will indulge me for just a few moments on this DLC detour, we need to explore how Dead Kings failed Arno's character. Dead Kings sets a rather high bar for itself by having a lot of questions to answer, namely by doing what the main game did not and showing the pivoting moment that causes Arno to have faith in the Brotherhood. We need to get a deep character study here, one that dwells in Arno's feelings and emotions towards the events of the main game, and allows us to breathe with this character as he uncovers the mystery of a dank and ruined area outside of France. Speaking of which, a lot of the cards are already at play here. Franciade is a beautifully dark and atmospheric city, wonderfully realised with thick fog and a depressing nature to it that sees it be the perfect backdrop for any AC fan to get a glimpse at the aftermath of the French Revolution, and it gives Arno a perfect location to embrace and overcome the darkness that lies inside himself. Arno is also given a new costume, a raggedy raider outfit that gives him an air of mystery, like a lonely wanderer with a dark past to be forgotten. He bears the new iconic weapon, the guillotine gun, a massive two-handed axe with a grenade launcher attached, Sitting silently on his back but capable of such mass destruction, it highlights that Arno is not one to be messed around with in this expansion. He is broken and, and loud in his attempt to take out his pain on others. The pieces are clearly all in place here, but for some reason, upon my replaying of the expansion, I found myself to not be making as many notes as the DLC in terms of its dialogue is incredibly plot focused, and the focus is not on Arno as a character, which I'm actually quite let down by, because as I said, I returned to this DLC thinking it may need its own separate video on it, for the amount it did to improve Arno's character, but I think 13 year old me was probably just so happy it was free, I convinced myself that the story was good. However, I'm jumping ahead a bit there, I want to start with the trailer for the DLC, which features a few cut details that I think would have helped to convey Arno's character more. Firstly, Arno has a beard in this trailer, which is not present in the final DLC, which is odd because the character model already exists, and would give players a unique appearance when visiting this area, post-completion. But more importantly, it means Arno doesn't look convincingly in ruins mentally as his costume now looks out of place on his character model. Some dirt on his face or a less looked after appearance would have gone a long way towards helping convey his state of mind, which the trailer excellently conveyed. He also features a few small costume changes, like a face mask similar to the one seen in Rogue, which would have helped to disguise his appearance in restricted areas, and add to the idea that Arno did not want to be noticed and also a black colour for the hood and cape, which would have added a darker look to his appearance that resembled that of his fearless outfit. The trailer ends with Arno giving a narration, saying, Perhaps it's time I let go of the past. Now after scouring the game, there is no such dialogue or even conversation about this in the DLC. It is never mentioned that Arno wishes to forget what happened to Elise, only that he wishes to run away from it. I can't believe I'm saying this, but this shows that the trailer gives more depth to Arno's character than the DLC itself, with a direct motivation for why Arno is trying to escape France. 
In the DLC, Arno also meets a small boy named Leon. He lives in an orphanage but wants to help defeat our villain Napoleon. Napoleon intends to use a powerful artifact underneath Saint Denis to mind control the people into rising up and ending the revolution, essentially cheating the history books. Leon's purpose in the story is to provide Arnor with a character he can finally save. Throughout Unity, Arnor was sometimes given and sometimes not the chance to save the ones he loved, and Leon gives him another chance to not indirectly kill him, and instead begin his road to redemption. It's also revealed that Leon is at the orphanage because his parents left for Spain to avoid the French Revolution. Leon wishes to free France and make it a safe place so that his parents can come back for him. Arno never vocally addresses any responsibility for this, but we should presume that this being a direct consequence of Arno's actions is what makes him feel a need to return Leon safely to his orphanage. The next point I have is regarding an interaction with Leon and Arno a little while later, where the opportunity is given to explore Arno's character, when Leon asks why he is running away and what he has against France. Arno doesn't really answer this, he instead chooses to be pretty horrible to Leon and tell him his parents are never coming back for him. You can't save them. They're never coming back. Jesus. They had a chance to give some insight into his character and once again made the player dislike Arno. Anyway, he proves to be very hypocritical in this moment, as immediately after, Arno mistakes a young redhead for Elise, only to find it isn't actually her, and we get the first real indication that Arno hasn't gotten over her death enough to focus on himself. After speaking to the head of the orphanage, Arno is very rude to her, after she calls love a prison that Arno is trapped in, and that Leon believed he could be the saviour of France. This seems to be enough to snap Arno out of his reclusive state, and he no longer wishes to leave France, but instead help Leon to retrieve the artefact before Napoleon can. Maybe my analysing skills have completely worn out at this point, but I'm starting to become a bit lost on Arno's motivation. I can't tell what it is that changes his mind here, this conversation is arguably the most important in the game, as it impacts his entire personality, and somewhere in this is the reason for why he returns to the Brotherhood. I'm going to just play out a section of this scene, and please do leave me your thoughts. Sometimes, love is a prison. His father taught me that. This, the orphanage, this is my true calling. They all tells me you could have been the saviour of France. Children. Madame Margot is behind the orphanage. Arno makes the important decision to be firm with Leon and tell him to stay behind while Arno throws himself into the danger, finally taking the power to prevent another death and bringing his responsibility to the forefront. Whilst a very underplayed moment, it genuinely shows Arno learning from his past mistakes. After Arno secures the artefact and sends it away from Napoleon, we see him back in his assassin robes, presumably three days later, since this is when the departure was meant to take place. Whatever happened in those three days, Arno has somehow made contact with the assassins and is now once again part of the Brotherhood. And this is where the DLC leaves us with Arno supposedly now off to do his training, which we see in the epilogue. I have to insert my opinion in here for a moment, as this really disappoints me. The DLC does not have any moment in which Arno mentions the Brotherhood, let alone talks about rejoining them. There's no indication of how he feels about their ideals, or if he even agrees with them, considering in the epilogue he talks about them as a warning, like he is no longer with them and is happier for it, yet in this DLC, we see him smiling as he wanders back to them. This really needed explaining, as this essential part of the story, where he decides the person he wants to be, is gone largely unexplored. The DLC is two hours long, and a large majority of the scenes are purely waffle about finding the next plot point, 
to get to this hidden temple. I don't know if the writers were expecting more time to go into his decision, or if they were genuinely lost, but I found the DLC to completely avoid its purpose in the story, and unfortunately will be a bitter end for those players that experience the DLC last. Over the course of this video, we've spent a lot of time getting to know Mr. Dorian. We've seen the beginnings and end of his character throughout the course of Assassin's Creed Unity, and the expansion Dead Kings. Back in 2014, at release, the response to this character was not well received from a majority of the fanbase, due to his whiny nature and misplaced accent. Yeah, that's right, I managed to go the entire video without mentioning that he doesn't have a French accent. Go me. However, after years for the community to heal, and a steep decline in integrity for the franchise, oh, make you alive. Unity has a cult following of sorts amongst fans, and praised for its ambition and storytelling. From my previous two character studies, the demand for Arno as my next analysis was a clear one and it's what inspired me to begin this monumental task. The story of Arno Victorian is one of naivety and the consequences that selfishness and a lack of patience can have on those you love and the wider world around you. At its centre, a young man at the dawn of the French Revolution, seeking a life he can never obtain due to the tragic events in his life. Using the creed to get what he wants, but failing because of his own deep internal flaws, and after much work and progress after the fact, comes out of it worthy of being named a master assassin after discovering his rightful place in the world. Whatever you have to say about the execution, on paper this story of a young man letting the worst of himself get the better of him is a naturally compelling narrative, dragging him into a conflict where neither side is clear on their goals, and he must focus on fulfilling his own in order to redeem himself in his own eyes. Arno's story is not one of revenge or a quest for knowledge or riches. It is one of self-discovery. On my journey analysing this character, I have found a deep respect for the struggles the writers went through when crafting this game, and the enormous pressure to deliver the first true next generation of Assassin's Creed, having to reinvent the wheel while staying true to the fans, and for that, I am deeply grateful for the game and this character. Now, I've said this man's name a total of 235 times across the course of this video, so I'm going to leave the rest to you. Let's get a little discussion going in the comments and do leave me your recommendations for any other characters you'd like me to cover. For the next few months, I will be returning to my movie format with shorter uploads until I can arrange time for the next project. I'd also like to take a moment to apologise for the gap between uploads. As you can imagine, this has taken a long time to prepare. I really do appreciate everyone that's stuck around to see the end of this video. I know it's a large one, but I hope that I've given something for the community to comment on. And most importantly, and something that I must mention, I have still yet to buy Valhalla. See you in the next video, guys.